restaurant sits at a busy downtown corner. As a mixed crowd shuffles from one bar to the next, they pause outside its window. Most people don't fully understand what's going on inside. A man plays his music. Outside, it can be seen. Inside, it can be heard. <laughs> That's the thing about it. He just loves life. Some guys or some people go down early. Uh, and uh, some possess the, the stuff, you might say, to, to last. He knows. He may have been the first hippie, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. the oldest hippie yeah. alive, yeah. Yeah, I guess jazz musicians don't lead the life of a normal, normal person. Blackest land, the whitest people. <laughs> Boy, that sign, that sign almost caused a Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. No, they put up World War One. The whitest people meant 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 good guys. Yeah. Blackest land and the, and the best boys for our, for uncle or whatever. It was they were totally innocent going up. It was one of those black with the, with the illuminated white, you know, light behind, no neon. This is 1918. I think it's put up. Right across the main street is a railroad track. Couldn't get in and out of town without reading the blackest land of whitest people. And then the Yankees started infiltrating down here like it got to be obscene so they finally had to take it down. I think his little sign says the blackest land of the nicest people. <laughs> no, that's one dream. I'm not, I'm not like other people for damn sure. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not like anybody I know. Not but plan. Just, I don't know. I could, maybe maybe the leprechaun has something to do with it. Again, like I've told you. I looked around. I was in Paris, France when I was 17 out of Greenville, Texas. That's a jump. Paris on Bastille Day. We walked off the boat train. There was a... Probably could smell was uh, mustard and perno. Lick, licorice juice and French mustard. So, been like that ever since. Like, how the hell, like, like, I'm a peasant, but, you know, how the hell could you, uh, other than a leprechaun and a set of drums, spend in Europe working two and a half hours a night with 20 local musicians as built-in guides and hosts? No way you can beat it. Same in South America. Same around the States five times and once across Canada. Ah, I've been 45. I was only in again. I went in 44 and came out in 45. That was pretty good over there. Uh, Japan, well, Europe, Europe had, had long since been over. There wasn't any question. Nobody was needed in the army. They were just trying to get the, the, the guy to goof off like me. Well, what the hell are you do? You're sitting around, you got, they, they, all you're doing is mowing grass, and if you push a lawnmower, you can carry a rifle, so you push it about two rows and sit down and say, I can't make it anymore. Otherwise, they're going to put you back marching up and down the goddamn road, you know. They tried to, they, 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 I, I don't think it was unfair, really. Like, going in, everything was gung-ho, and I'm finally in the Army. I'll do the best I can, patriotic, you know, that garbage. And it starts out with some six weeks at zero degrees, and nobody knows where the hell you're going. You're not getting any salary. They're trying to figure some way to get me out of being shipped out to West Texas to be a, to be a gunner. Find somebody came up with a bright idea. I'm sick of those days. I was on a six feet one. 
and they went out there to some, some supply store and got a brand new pair of GI shoes which had an inch and a half heel on them. And I was six, two and a half, half inch over. And that's how I got in the band. And you're standing there with no clothes on, these guys are talking about your life. So I said, I got an idea, go get a pair of shoes. And I spent the year there and then till the Battle of the Bulls when they cleaned everybody out of everything and put everybody in the infantry. And then I went to Gainesville for a couple of months. And then got a little yellow card that said like uh, agoraphobia, fear of open places, crowds. I can't believe this. I'm playing along and watching a city being bombarded. I know, I know. I just realized what I was watching. We're over here just having a good time. Well, I mean, like I'm, I'm, I'm watching somebody above, you know, like explosions going off all over the goddamn city. What? On TV, up there, we're playing along like a little ballad. I'm watching the goddamn city be annihilated. What? Say, tell me. I don't know. I, no, I, no, this, no, this, 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 this is aircraft because these damn things are bouncing all over the place. You know, probably somewhere in in uh, Kuwait or what's this thing. That dumb son of a bitch, why'd he have to start this war? That, that could be Armageddon, man, you know that? He had a started a little trio, and uh, he always kind of went for that type of you know, instrumentation because he uh, needed a lot of freedom to do his thing, vibes or marimba or xylophone. And so uh, he had a guitarist, and that was uh, probably one of the earliest Ed Hayden trios. We had a lot of fun, but it didn't last very long. Just, uh, I guess we weren't quite ready for Ed. <laughs> you guys got together yeah. in 84, did you say? Yes. Uh -huh. What's it like playing with Ed Hayden? Well, uh, <clears throat> it's like uh, being uh, almost pushed over a cliff. <laughs> Ed challenges you. Uh, if you don't have chops to begin with, uh, you're left in the dust. If, if one tune, if, if the entire job were composed of one tune uh, and you didn't have the chops, uh, Ed would finish an hour and a half ahead of you. That's, the, uh, <laughs> That's right. The best way you That's can right. Have it. I asked him once, I said, well, when I rejoined him, I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, just play anything you want, anything that comes to your mind, you know, just, just anything. And it literally uh, means that, and uh, it's uh, one of the most wonderful experiences because uh, he puts you out front, you know, you, there's no backing out, you're there, man, and you better produce if you're worth anything, musically speaking. And uh, it's uh, just uh, something that uh, comes over you working with Ed. Yeah. He's done so many things in his life, he's, from the uh, playing uh, the percussion section with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra to cooking. Mm -hmm. He probably uh, could have. A millionaire in, yeah. in any number of fields, or at least uh, extremely successful. But uh, uh, he marched to his own beat. And, yeah. Uh, you gotta give him credit for that. One of his uh, pat lines, and, and, and uh, I'm sure it's true, that he's, he says he's had. Uh, Three ex-wives and two bars, or was it? 
three bars and two eggs lives in uh, the Virgin Islands. He couldn't remember. Yeah. But that was a shtick line for him, you know. So, yeah. But I'm sure that it's, it's probably more of uh, uh, truth than poetry. Mm -hmm. An individual with a capital I, there's no, there's no uh, other way to describe it. Well, I would like to say something at this point. I can hardly wait till the next time he calls me. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, thank you. going at the same time as one one that opened at seven in the morning and went over midnight. A normal restaurant type thing. One that opened at seven at night and went to seven in the morning. Also a good restaurant. Like Pheasant, Dover Soul, Escargo, shit like that, not Hamburg. Well also served Hamburg, but we had, we had a good menu. And the routine was this, you get up in the morning, hard up wouldn't show up, so you got a hangover that you can't believe and try, say, five pounds of bacon strips on a grill about yay big, blowing smoke in your face with a hangover and two hours sleep. It ain't good. It is formidable, man, I'm telling you. It is heavy. Okay, so you go out to the bar and you have two Bloody Marys and, uh, and a shot of vodka just, just to top it off. Go back in and do it. Go back in and scrape the grease off in the office, wash your face, sit there, and by that time, like, uh, in time for your 11th, it's the British morning tote, rum tote on the boats, right, in the elevenses. So you uh, sit down, you have a, I think in those days I was drinking martinis, have a large fishbowl type martini, like this, this is not drinking, it's just socializing, all right? You talk to somebody that's coming in for lunch, go back and do the lunch thing. If you have lunch, you have a little split bottle of wine with lunch. You have the normal American type? No, I have, at first it's high tea. You gotta have British tea, but you just, it's not all with high tea. This is, if you're civil, it's a glass of sherry. If you're lush, it's a bottle of booze, or a glass of booze. Then comes cocktail hour. See, this is six, but we're getting up at four o'clock, now we're down to six o'clock. We'll have dinner at 7.30 or 8. Another bottle of wine. And you get up, take a nap, and then you go out tonight and do some serious drinking. So it adds up. Every day. Oh God, 20 years, oh more than that. Yeah, for years. Ex, the last wife is still doing it. She, did, she had no idea she's a lush. It's all civil, you, ne you never get potted, as they say. I mean, you never thought. But you also that never said, so, yeah, never, sure. I never gave it a thought. Well, yeah, at the end of the night, like you're sitting there, you really say, I mean, I've had five martinis, yeah, I shouldn't be doing this, I'm gonna have a hell of a head tomorrow. You, know, you never sober up, really. Wisconsin to go to North Texas when I was, you know, 18, and uh, I guess I probably met Ed when I was about 20, 21, and I started playing with him immediately, immediately. I sat in that one night, and then he gave me a gig, <laughs> and uh, that's where I met all the players. I'd say that Ed Hagen really gave me my start in town, because at that time, the Taboo was the hangout place for all the musicians to come, and so if you were playing there, you got to meet everybody, and they got to hear you, and 
I don't really think there's another club that has that type of a atmosphere anymore, but back then it was wonderful. It was a perfect jumping off point. Yeah, he's a real original, and he is definitely the most charming man I've ever met. He told me he had not ever dated a woman over 30. And when I first moved to town, Ed was, oh gosh, we must have been in the 60s then, late 50s, 60s, and he had gorgeous women hanging off of him all the time. All the other, the young guy musicians would freak out, they'd go, how does this guy do this? And he would come into the clubs with these beautiful women, and they just adore him. This is a friend of mine was mentioning how young musicians stay and uh, the way they look, you know, and I'll tell people how old I am and they don't believe I'm 37. And a lot of people think, well, that's, you know, of course, when bright lights to say, well, yeah, let's probably yeah, at least that. <laughs> but um, a lot of us tend to, and well, like Ellington and Count Basie and those people, God, they kept traveling and kept doing things until they were, you know, really old. And they never looked their age, never acted their age. And it's a good thing. I think music does keep you real human. That it's still as much of a challenge now as it was when I started to play the tempos he plays. <laughs> yeah, his gig is considered the marathon gig in town, especially since he doesn't use a drummer. You know, it's always a good judge of how your chops are doing. You know, to go play with Ed Hagen. If you can't make it through the gig, you got to get back to the practice room. <laughs> and Ed makes it look so effortless. Sometimes I sit back and listen to the stuff he's playing and go, God, how can anybody move that fast? Yeah, the sticker. This is priceless. I don't know how many other musicians in town have these. I know Bob Leroy, the bass player, used to work with him. Has got one on the back of his upright bass, stuck right on the wood. Is Ed, not, Ed gave Bob and I these stickers on the same gig at the 8-0. Wonderful. Changed a hell of a lot, really, over the years. I've gotten a lot more polite. Yeah. Yeah. He's, well, you. Pretty smooth with the ladies, still, you know. I mean. Not really. They, 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 they instinctively know I love them. They know that. Some of them are sleazy, and some of them are classy. But you love them, you love them. That's the end of that story. You might 
might try to, I think, in, in many cases, you'll try to say, oh, no, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to do that, I can't do that. But there's something deep inside of you that says, this is you right here. You have to attend to it. You know, sooner or later, you're gonna have to do something about it. It'll either make you, or it'll just make you great, or uh, do something positive for you, or it'll destroy you. what you are, a jazz player or not, no matter what the gig you're on. It's got to be an attitude applied to, to an approach to playing, but not a contrived attitude. It's contrived and all of a sudden you're, you're a loser. Look, I was born in the Depression. I grew up in the 30s. What year were you born? 1918, I'm 72. I was about 20 years younger three months ago. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> What is, it, what is it that you got, man? Well, in that case, what do I got? I got cancer of the liver. Or bile ducts, which is infringed on the liver now. Nothing's going to cure it. The chemotherapy might very well uh, hold it in check for quite a respectful amount of time. Yeah. Last day of January, I fell asleep at a wheel in the hills in Arkansas. I'd put the thing, put the jets and the roots in the ditch. And got a, got a DWI out which I shouldn't have gotten. I was outside the car sitting on the ground drinking half my booze waiting for somebody to pick me up. When they, when they got me. Uh, I guess the next thing was the uh, was the airplane. Remember about three or four months ago, mid late spring, an airplane crashed on Malkenberg? Yeah. 30 feet behind my car. And the next thing that happens, the IRS gets on my ass for the first time in 15 years. And I got mugged. And then the next thing that goes out, like I begin to join this, I figure somewhere the guy must, must have hit something. It, 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 it didn't hurt. I didn't know no clubs, just fists. So I went by, uh, went by Baylor's, uh, uh, emergency room on the Saturday after we got out to make sure I didn't give anybody some kind of a bug. I was turning yellow, I didn't want to hang on and So the guy said, you don't have any, uh, you got no no disease, but you better go get a checkup. And three weeks later, they cut my gallbladder out. You know, hell of a, hell of a year, man. But it's no big deal. You know? What can you do about it? I can go screaming and jumping up and down and then I got done if I can good. tuxedo and he walks in 
to the music hall and uh, goes into the back and gets behind his timpani. When the whole thing was over, it was completed, this works they did, uh, everyone proceeded to walk away wearing their tuxedos, black shoes, and Ed walks away, he's wearing a pair of yellow moccasins. <laughs> it's Ed Hagen. It is Ed Hagen. <laughs> I mean, out of nowhere. But he figured no one could see him, yeah. And nobody did. <laughs> no one did. There's no beginning and no end to Ed Hagen. No. Well, gentlemen, I enjoyed it. I hope I didn't bore you too much. You just want a few of his favorite tunes or something like that.